few months ago, I realized that I needed to get a new bass clarinet, which was horrible news for me because a bass clarinet, if you didn't know, costs a load of money, like along the lines of buying a nice new car. And I am a freelance musician slash burgeoning music YouTuber. And so needless to say, I'm not made of money. What happened was that the pads on my old Bundy bass clarinet were literally falling off of its keys during performances. Obviously, this is unacceptable and unprofessional. I was in Las Vegas at the time that this was going on. So I Googled musical instrument repair and stumbled upon a place with a vaguely familiar name called Kessler and Sons Music. Hopped in a rental car and begged them to help me out with an emergency repair. When I got there, I quickly realized that I had heard the name Kessler before because they make a custom low C bass clarinet that I had heard reviewed favorably by the bass clarinet king himself, Michael Lowenstern of Ear Spasm Music. It is something you definitely should put on your consideration list and give it a try. I took some time play testing one on a Friday. I took the weekend to think about it before buying this thing on the following Monday. But boy, did I fret about this situation. It was all I could talk about for the entire weekend to the great consternation of my friends and coworkers. And I realized that there aren't really good resources online for people in my situation trying to decide on a new instrument to buy. So in this video, I'm going to share a checklist of things you should consider before buying a new instrument. And I'm gonna use my new Kessler bass clarinet as an example. One, assess your needs. Before you even think about buying a new instrument, you have to decide why it is that you need one. Maybe you're an amateur. They're a bunch of fucking amateurs. Uh, Wal hey, Walter, will you just shut the fuck up? That wants to buy something to play in your spare time. That's cool. Maybe you're a parent of a student who is so passionate about their band or orchestra program, and you want to do whatever you can to help them excel. That's really, really cool. Or you could be a professional like myself, and that's cool too, I hope. Um, you could be a well-off collector of shiny objects and you got bored of cars, so you want something cool to display on your wall. And if that's the case, skip buying an instrument and give that money to charity, obviously, you douche. So let's go through those one at a time. If you're looking for an instrument to play for fun, then you really don't need an excellent instrument. I know the temptation is great, but trust me, there are plenty of really great instruments that maybe don't have the markups associated with name brand recognition or that aren't made out of the finest materials. And in my eyes, that's a plus if you're not playing the instrument every single day because you don't have to worry about time-consuming maintenance and wood cracking or things like that. And unless you're really virtuosic, you're just not gonna notice the subtle differences between these instruments anyways. If you're looking for an instrument for your kid, then again, you really don't wanna buy a great instrument. Don't let them pressure you into it, mom and dad, because they may lose interest, they may treat the instrument with negligence. In fact, they probably will. Once, when I was in high school, I dropped my saxophone from the top bleacher during a basketball game inside the bleachers and watched it ping off of each support rail like a marble falling down a Plinko board or something like that. Right down the middle, come on, here we go. Come on, baby, let's go. Back, 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 back. Well, you got 100 bucks. But if your kid is really serious and they decide that they maybe want to major in music and go to a conservatory and potentially try to make their living off of playing music, then that would be a great time to consider upgrading to an intermediate or even a professional instrument. And at that point, it's really important to remember that you don't know anything and you need to consult a trusted music teacher or professional. Help me. Help you. Help me. Me help you. Now, if you're a music professional, picking out a new instrument becomes a lot more complicated because you're going to hear differences between different instruments, even of the same model. For example, my old clarinet teacher, Larry Guy, tried out 40 different Buffet R13 clarinets, and he picked out his two favorites 
and had those mailed to me from a clarinet convention in Florida. And then I tried out both of those and agonized over which one I liked better. And I chose the one with nickel keys rather than the one with silver keys. And every professional that I've met who tries to play my clarinet or who fixes it or looks at it or hears me play it always says, damn, you got a really good R13. This is a special one. It's one out of 40. Two, create a budget. Buying an instrument is not like getting an engagement ring or purchasing a new home. There's no rule of thumb about what percentage of your income you should budget for this type of expense. And every instrument is different in terms of resale value. Violins and saxophones, for example, hold their value and sometimes appreciate in value. So if you were to resell them, you could make a profit. Clarinets and oboes, on the other hand, deteriorate in their bore over time and you need to replace them throughout your career. So when you go to resell them, you're only going to be able to get a fraction of what you originally paid. Amateurs and parents should budget whatever they feel comfortable with when buying a new instrument. However, I would just strongly recommend against financing an instrument because it's a bad deal. Over time, you're going to pay more than the ticketed price of the instrument and you don't need to do that. I would recommend budgeting for an instrument that you can afford to pay for in cash. Oftentimes, professionals need to consider financing. Stringed instruments, for example, like basses, cellos, violas, violins, those often cost tens of thousands of dollars. And woodwind doublers like myself, well, it's a tough career because we need to constantly be investing in the gear that we need to work. So you're going to also spend tens of thousands of dollars over time on a collection of woodwind instruments. And ours is an interesting scenario because we're specializing in one or two instruments that we're really good at. And the rest of the instruments that we play, we're not so good at. An older colleague of mine once told me that the rule of thumb should be the worse you are at an instrument, the better of an instrument you need. And I get what he's saying, but I would edit that slightly and say, the worse you are at an instrument, the more stable of an instrument you need, because oftentimes better instruments are actually harder to play. Okay, so to illustrate these points... Let's use my new Kessler Low C custom second generation bass clarinet. I paid about $2,500 for this and additionally another $500 for the BAM case, which to me seemed like it would offer more protection than the case that they sell with it. So for a total of around $3,000. Now to somebody who isn't a clarinetist, this might seem like an insane expense, but for context, let me tell you what great bass clarinets cost. The top of the line Selmer low C bass clarinet, which for my money is the best bass clarinet out there, goes for around $15,000, okay? And the top of the line Buffet, the Tosca, goes for $16,000. And then there's a tier below that of wooden bass clarinets that are made by Yamaha and LeBlanc and a company called Royal Global. And those all go for somewhere in the range of seven to $10,000. Damn. So $2,500 is actually insanely inexpensive for a bass clarinet. And something to keep in mind is that if you're a professional, which technically means that you're earning the majority of your income in a given year through music, then this is, a, is considered a necessary tool of the trade. And thus it can be written off against your income for a given year. So when tax time rolls around, that can result in you getting an even bigger tax return. Or if you're earning the majority of your income through a variety of 1099 jobs where tax isn't being withheld, it will significantly decrease the amount of taxes that you owe. So I am a woodwind doubler and I'm traveling with this instrument, so I don't even want a top of the line wooden bass clarinet. Then I have to worry about a variety of things like the wood cracking when I change locations or um, something bad happening to the instrument in transit. This Kessler Custom Low C, it's, it's made out of synthetic material and the key work to my understanding, is manufactured in China and assembled by the Kesslers. It feels extremely professional. It feels very legit. And 
um, it has a few quirks which I'll get into later. It's a good option for me and what I needed to do was play test it and so I'll tell you about that process next. Three, play test multiple different instruments. This is the single most important part of considering buying a new instrument. You really have to ignore what an instrument looks like and focus really hard on how it sounds, feels, and responds. But listen, I've fallen prey to buying a sexy instrument before and I probably will again. So again, using my Kessler, I'm gonna show you exactly what to do when you're first confronted with a new instrument. First, check out the instrument's intonation. Intonation essentially means, is the instrument in tune with itself? Is every single chromatic pitch essentially in tune? And don't worry so much about the tone quality at first because you can change that later down the road. But if the instrument doesn't have close to perfect intonation, there's nothing you're gonna be able to do about that because that has to do with the way the instrument is manufactured. And other than pretty expensive repairs and changes, there's not too much that you can do about it. So I would literally go sit down with a tuner in front of you and do every single note like this. all of this in front of a tuner. Now, again, before checking out the tone quality, check out how the instrument feels in conjunction with your body. Does it sit comfortably in your lap or whatever in your arms? Um, does the key work feel even and comfortable throughout the full range of the horn? For example, this Kessler has a really weird quirk. It has a bunch of weird quirks, but one of them is that pressing down the D key requires a lot of extra effort. So that's not a deal breaker, but it's something to keep in mind. It's definitely in the con column. Then, still before considering the tone quality, which I think might sound crazy to some people, but trust me, you'll see why later, you want to check out the response of the instrument. Does it take a lot or a little effort to produce sound on the instrument? And are some notes harder to play than others? And generally, less effort is desirable, but um, there are exceptions to that. Do certain individual pitches stick out in terms of tone quality? Like are some of the notes brighter or darker or stuffier or whatever? Like for example, another quirk of the Kessler is that I think that the second lowest D flat has a stuffy tone and so does B. And most clarinets, that B is stuffy, but I'll show you what I mean. <laughs> Again, that's not great, but it's not a deal breaker um, because when you learn to play an instrument, you learn about its flaws and you learn how to compensate for them. And now we can consider tone quality. And this is the category that trumps all the others, but is the last one, in my opinion, that you should consider. Using my Con 26M alto saxophone as an example, that instrument sucks in a lot of ways. Uh, the mechanics are so uncomfortable. Learning to play it was essentially like learning to play a whole new instrument. It's difficult to play. The intonation is objectively horrible. It's, it's very out of tune. But despite all those flaws, because it's such an old instrument, it sounds fucking incredible. It has the most beautiful tone. It's so fun to play. It sings, it resonates. And uh, I'm willing to sacrifice all those other elements uh, in order to have that sound. But I have to keep in mind that it's still not acceptable in a professional situation oftentimes to use a horn like that. So I also have a Yamaha Custom Z, which is kind of like a perfect horn. Or the analogy I would use is it's that kid in class who gets perfect grades and does everything right, but the teacher still kind of doesn't like them because they just don't have any personality. And my con, on the other hand, is different. It's like the kid in class that the teacher secretly prefers and loves, even though the kid struggles and um, does things his own way 
and has a lot of personality. Does that make sense? I don't know. Uh, as a teacher, that resonates with me. But anyways, I saved the tone quality category for last because if you have an instrument that performs perfectly in all of the preceding categories, it's got great intonation, it feels great to play, and it responds great when you try to play it, then you can often change the tone quality. Like, people should know that for clarinets and saxophones, the mouthpiece, the ligature, and the reed is like maybe 80%, 75% of how the instrument sounds. With other instruments like vocals, necks, barrels, the barrel is this thing right here. Um, those also have a tremendous impact on the way the instrument performs. So um, that's why you wanna consider this last because you can change the tone quality of the instrument to a certain extent. Now, what should you even be listening for in the tone quality? This is a hard thing to define. And to be honest, it's gonna change over time as you develop your own unique character as an instrumentalist and as your ears improve. So I'll just tell you what I'm listening for. I'm going to start again by playing a lot of long tones before I start doing anything else and just listen to the character of each note. I want there to be a lot of overtones present in the sound. Um, I want to hear that the horn can project, um, which means that it can sort of throw sound. Like um, That's a hard thing to describe, but you know it when you hear it. Um, I want to hear that the horn is resonant and that each note is equally resonant. And I try to define the character of the sound using descriptive words. And sort of like a sommelier with wine, over time, um, I'm trying to make the terms that I use for the character of the instrument become more and more codified in my mind so that when I hear it, I can say, oh yeah, that's dark, that's brittle, that's woody, that's whatever. Like stagnant pond water? near Chernobyl. A really smart thing to do is to go to an instrument distributor with an excerpt or two memorized so that you can play the same exact excerpt on each different instrument that you try. That way you can record yourself playing the same music on multiple different instruments and you can listen for the dynamic range and the articulation is it buoyant? Is it bouncy? Or is it tubby and flubby? Um, can you play really soft? Can you play really loud? Does the excerpt come to life? Um, what control do you have over the instrument playing the exact same thing? But usually there's one great tell, which is that if you find yourself drawn back to an instrument constantly, or if you find that you're unable to stop playing it, that you really are just enjoying yourself and it seems to be conducive to playing, then that's the instrument for you because if it's going to be fun for you to play, if it's going to beg you to take it out of its case and put it together, then you're going to want to play it more and you're going to practice more often and you'll get better at music. So, you know, follow your instincts. Four, ask advice from knowledgeable sources. Finally, don't make this decision on your own. Remember that you have inherent biases and that you don't know everything. Also, remember that what a player hears is a very different picture from what a listener hears that's even standing just a few feet away. And you will likely find yourself torn between a couple options. And so at this point, it's really important that you bring a trusted colleague, friend, teacher, or music professional with you when you're trying out instruments. Offer to buy them lunch if they'll do this for you. It's really worth the expense. However, in the case of this Kessler instrument, I didn't have the time to do any of that stuff because I'm on the road and I was leaving imminently, but I immediately fell in love with this instrument. I played on it for about half an hour and I was really blown away. I understood what all the hype was about. Um, I couldn't believe that such an inexpensive instrument felt and sounded so darn close to a professional horn. In this price range, I've never heard a more convincing bass clarinet 
Not that I have tons of bass clarinet experience. So I texted truly just about every colleague that I know who plays the bass clarinet to ask for their advice, risking being kind of annoying. And each one of them basically said the same thing. They said, A, I can't believe that you've been playing that shitty plastic Bundy for your whole career so far. Um, B, they couldn't believe how relatively inexpensive it was. And C, they either knew from personal experience or had heard that they're very good. And so everybody said, do it. And so I made the investment. And that's the note that I'd like to end this video on. When you're buying a new instrument, no matter who you are, you're making an investment. Amateurs are investing in using their free time creatively and constructively and in improving their personal lives. Parents are investing in their children's future and professionals are investing in their career. And I realized when I when my bass clarinet started falling apart that I couldn't really consider myself a professional if I wasn't using the best tool that I could afford. But I also did not want to be in financial distress again. I say again because I've made this mistake in the past. I know firsthand that buying too expensive of an instrument and then being in financial distress and not being able to make the payments on a loan is very stressful and makes life miserable. And I am never going to do that again. So I decided to compromise. I bought the best instrument that I could afford. Uh, it has its flaws. It has its quirks. It's by no means uh, a top of the line instrument. And I'm sure it's going to have issues because of its sort of cheaper construction. Um, it's not going to have as much lasting power as a buffet or a Selmer, but it's really, really good. I really love this horn. I find myself playing it constantly, which is great. I also find myself speaking glowingly about it to anyone who will listen to me, which is another good sign. Plus, I have the comfort of knowing that I did everything in my power to make sure that the purchase was a good one. So now I have this new member of my musical family and... I hope that you found this video useful. I just realized that um, ever since I was young, I never really understood what I was supposed to be looking for and listening for in an instrument. If you have specific questions for me, by all means, feel free to leave them in the comments below and I will do my best to get to all of your questions. If I can't help you, I'll direct you to somebody who can. So best of luck to you in finding your new horn.